Good morning. Um, my name is Andrew and I'm recovering under Erner. Let's start with the serenity prayer. God, grant us a serenity to accept the things which cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Anybody take notes of what I just said? In working the steps with my sponsor, John, he was very insistent that I memorize the principles of the steps. That's important because in 12-step recovery, we want to practice these principles in our affairs. We get a little, okay. We don't master these principles in all our affairs. Masterly, mastering a principle is like, let's say, I could play the guitar, you could wake me up at four o'clock in the morning and say, play a G major seventh chord and I'll do it. Andrew, tie your shoelace. I could do that. Stand in front of a bunch of people and make a joke. I could do that. I, I, I've mastered the basic ideas of doing this. So I can never master the principles of all 12 steps. I can't because fear will crop up. Uh, anger can crop up. Resentment can crop up. And there are other steps that I have to deal with that on a daily basis. Also known as step 10 and 11. And of course, by the end of this, we'll go through a little more application to what that actually means. But in step one, the principle is surrender. Surrender is important because without surrendering, we can't do the next 11 steps. It cannot be done. We have to admit that we're powerless over under earning. <laughs> And our, and our life has become unmanageable. We're powerless over cell phones and iPhones. The second principle that we're gonna be talking about is belief. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. And sanity in this fellowship is different from sanity in AA. Sanity in this fellowship is different from sanity in OA or SLAA or GA. It's a different type of sanity. It's a much more hands-on, action-based sanity. It's a much more vision-based sanity. It's a much more going through a little fear at a time with other people's support type of sanity. Step three is about commitment. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves would restore us to sanity. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we made a decision to turn our life and our will over to a power greater than ourselves. And as it's the, the joke in the Joe McHugh book is that you had three frogs sitting on a log. One made the decision to swim upstream. How many left? None. Three. Three. Only, one only made the decision. He didn't actually swim upstream. So as, uh, as I learned in step three, there's not a lot of recovery in step three. It's just a commitment. It's setting us up, we're setting up for step four. But we need one, two, and three to get to step four and five, of course. And surrender is important in step one because it creates, it creates the basis of belief. If we can't surrender, it's like, gee, God, I'm powerless over this under earning then how can we get to belief? Because if we're not surrendering, we're coming back to our will. Many times when I sponsor people, I say to them, if you've got a job for $250,000 a year, would you still need UA? If you've got a job where if you got won the lottery and you have a million dollars in your bank account, would you still need UA? If you've got a job doing your vision, whatever that is, being a concert master for a symphony orchestra, having your own talk show, and they were paying you a million a year, would you still need UA? And I need to hear a firm yes on all of those for me to sponsor anyone. Because sponsoring someone in this fellowship is like a six, seven month process. And if they're not totally in a state of surrender, well then we can't move on to belief. And then we can't move from belief on 
to having made that decision to turn the will in our life over to power greater than ourselves. Bill Wilson says that addiction is basically self-will run riot. But yet we have to have some will. <clears throat> I had to have some will to come here today, to get up, right? I had to just made a decision to come here as part of my will. I could have made the decision to, you know, go down the street and find a liquor store and get plastered. But I, but I didn't. That would have been self-will run riot. But it's very easy for us to take our will back. Believe me. That's why no day is ever perfect. No day is ever perfect. There is always days where we are taking our will back and there's days where we're saying, thy will be done. And the, the more fear triggers of the day, whether it's money, sex, relationships, the more triggers, the easier it is to take our will back and say, no, I'm gonna do it my way. I know better. And that's why we can't recover alone. We need to have an action partner. We need to have action meetings. We need to have a sponsor. Isolation, as I think Matt was saying last night, doing something by yourself is, is, a, is a guaranteed way to totally screw up 12-step recovery, and I have done it. I've done it. I know what that means. So let's talk a little bit about step one. And after this, we're going to do a little writing on what we're talking about today, and then I'd like to have a couple of people to share. Or maybe what we'll do is we'll do, I know, I've got an even better idea. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about it, do some writing, then people talk to themselves, talk to your neighbor about what you've written, and then we'll have some people share about what they've written based on what I'm saying. Uh, for me, what was step one? Step one was, was understanding that I couldn't let go of deprivation. Because the bottom line of this fellowship, I mean, if you're a drunk in LA, and if you're a drunk in AA and recovery is sobriety, prosperity, as I said last night, is the goal of this fellowship in many different ways. I mean, and, and let's just talk about that for a second. Uh, at, at one of my low, lowest points before UA began, I worked as a card salesman selling really like grade B and C cards. So I had to run around and sell really bad greeting cards. I mean, cards like, I hate you, I don't want to see you again. <laughs> uh, and I would get, and, and like, you know, uh, a mingle of facetious, but it was very, very uh, inferior product. So what would happen is that I was, I was condemning myself to running around getting little $100 orders. So like in the book about UA, I was like, I was always busy and I was always hungry. I was always busy and I was always hungry because I just didn't have it in me to say, to sell something where I can make $200,000 a year working 40 hours a week. I couldn't even conceive of that. In fact, I had a couple of those interviews, and I just like literally ran out because I wanted to go back to my little under-earning cave. So I'd work five days a week selling uh, really bad greeting cards and note cards and stuff like that. I was driving all over New York. And funny, sometimes my hands would just go into this position. So in, in a way, I was on a very primal level saying, God, please help me without knowing it. I would sit and be at a red light and I'd be doing this. So sometimes the body's a lot wiser than the mind. Sometimes the body's a lot wiser than the mind. So um, then on the weekends, I would go to Channel 5 in New York and run the teleprompter machine. Now this was really this undiluted cave. I would, I would go back in the scenery, I'd be there at five o'clock, totally destroying my weekend. And I'd be sitting there with my magazines and whatever, the little television, and sitting behind the scenery, waiting for the first promo break at seven, whether it's tonight, seven o'clock, three murders, two deaths, and an extortion. And then at 10 o'clock, they, they you know, hit the computer, run this thing, make the words move to this person so they could see the words at the same time. And then I'd go home, wake up at five o'clock in the morning, drive back to the city, and make another $120 working for the sports reporters, doing the same thing. And so I was working seven days a week. This was a 100% total deprivation life. 100% total deprivation life. If this was an AA, I'd be talking about coming out of rehab and detox and being at Murphy's Bar and lying in a pool of blood at four o'clock in the morning with my, you know, my wife banging on the door. 
Did I have any leisure? No. Did I have any fun? No. Was I making really any money in a substantial healthy way? No. Was I condemning me to not even having a weekend? Was I? No. Uh, yes, I... <laughs> Well, now, if I said yes, and he said no about what I said about he said, then what he's saying about what I said was, hmm. basically, I was saying, no, Angie, you're not entitled to a weekend. You're not entitled to make enough money to pay taxes. What you're going to do is you're going you're gonna to just like scrunch by getting little bits of brain, little bits of thing, and go back to your little cave, and then you're not even going to have fun this weekend. You're not even going to be able to relax. So what I just spelled out was before you a NDA, a 100% deprivation, under-earning reality. 100%. The reality that, that, that fostered UA was after six years of DA, and the thing about it was that, I mean, I love DA, I'm still in it, but I was saying, hey, how come I'm solvent and, I, and I'm living in, a, in a, an apartment with mice? Why am I solvent and living with mice? It doesn't make any sense. The mice are doing better than I am. And why am I sitting at this desk and looking out at, at a dumpster across the street? I mean, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me to look for another apartment. And I was making $70,000 a year at the time. I was a single guy. I wasn't exactly qualified for the New York Times neediest cases, but I was living a total deprivation reality. I wasn't even allowing myself a decent place to live. The uh, cup uh, that was cracked, that, I, that, that started the thought about this fellowship, was cracked on that side, and, and I had coffee in it. And rather than throwing it away, I just turned it around. And I just drank from the other side. I was committed to keeping on to that, that little bit of deprivation of having some porcelain just sticking out of the cup. And then I began to look around to the whole apartment, and it was dirty, and it was, and it was, uh, it was horrible. And, clo and, and in fact, I had a relationship once where this woman said, you know, hey, Mike, <laughs> you have, uh, you, 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 your clothes are torn. I was wearing clothes that were torn. I was wearing shoes. I was wearing rocks. That, I mean, it was literally the, the whole disease. It was like seeing one of these clutter cars in New, in New York where all these like 3,000 magazines and newspaper is, and there's just enough room for the driver to sit in the car. Ever see those? <laughs> uh, the guy probably said, what's the problem? I can get into the car. There's no problem. So I didn't see there was a problem. Uh, so in step two, came to believe that a power greater than myself would restore me to sanity, came from really being in 12-step recovery, being in DA, and seeing that it was a spiritual change that people had gone through. And I had gone through a spiritual change because I was paying my bills on time. I did have my bill shrine. I had a, I had a bill shrine where, where, where all the bills had a little magic marker thing on about when they were due, and I'd make sure they were in the mail by that time. So I had a bill shrine. So I knew that I had gone through a spiritual change in terms of debting. I was paying my taxes on time. Uh, I did not use credit cards. Uh, I didn't, uh, well, that was before DA relapsed, but at that time I was, <laughs> I was in very good shape. So I knew I had gone through a spiritual change. So I said, if I can go through a spiritual change through DA, then there has to be this thing called UA. So step three, made a decision to turn my life and my will over to the power of greater than myself. Well, I knew one thing, though, that in terms of debting, that my will was always screwing things up. I mean, I knew that, so yeah. I don't want to hang on to my will. I'd rather turn that over to God. And I did understand, I did understand experientially what a power greater than myself meant. I did know that when I, when I went down on my knees and I did my serenity prayer, that I felt an arm, a hand on my shoulder. I did know 
how it how it felt to say thy will be done or God I'm turning this day over to you now I don't even say I'm turning this day over to you now I'm saying God please help me with this business today if it would be your will to do so I never say God I want five hundred thousand dollars or God I want my pony or buy my swimming pool because then I'm telling God what God should you do so I don't do that I say God please help me with my business today if it would be thy will to do so today I woke up at four o'clock in the morning because I'm still in New York Times I said God please help me get back to sleep if it would be your will to do so and I did get back to sleep so clearly this does work the um, step two is about came to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. In OA, sanity is abstaining from white flour, rice, sugar. In DA, uh, solvency is about staying away from credit cards, unsecured loans, paying bills late. In AA, sanity is not drinking one day at a time. Is that right? Am I on track so far? So what's sanity here? What is sanity here? After, after we're saying, came to believe a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. Because we're all here because we're living insane lives. Not maybe insane, but sometimes insane, but well, usually it's unsane. It's not sane. Well, that relates to the fact that we all have a role to play on this planet. There's a soul in us that wants to do different things. You might want to design software. You might want to start a circus for children. You might want to become a uh, clinical psychologist. You might want to become a, uh, a pro bono attorney. But we have a role to play. Part of my role on this planet was, was getting this thing off the ground, but that's not enough. It's not enough. I'm a musician. I'm a comedian. I'm an actor. I'm a writer. It's important for me to, to know that there are roles that God wants me to play on this planet. So in terms of being restored to sanity through step two, we have to really be in alignment with God and say, God, what is your will for me to do? What is your will for me to do? And one of the things I learned in step two was that I'll never be happier. I will never be happier in life than doing what God's intention is for me to do. In the, in the book that I use, there were illustrations of certainly the Wright brothers, the guy that did the presidential mountain range and these were all based on belief but belief is a very tentative state and we don't always know that you know we're, 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 we're okay, fine I'll believe but it's also a qualitative qualitative state that it grows with, with, with spiritual recovery but we all have in us our roles to play on the planet Earth. My, my role was not selling grade C greeting cards, driving around the Bronx and, and Queens. My role was not running the teleprompter at Channel 5 on the weekends and, go, and then going home and coming back to the city and do, working on the sports reporters. That was my will. I wasn't saying thy will be done. I was saying my will be done. I was coming up with a toxic solution to this, this, this experience called reality. And I was putting a spin job on it. Now at the time, yeah, did I have, did I have projects that I was working on? Yes, I said, yeah, I'm working on being a comedian. Was I working at it? No. I said, I'm working on a children's book. Was I working on it? No. So I had a number of things that I said I was doing. But it's like an alcohol. You're gonna say, hey, you're gonna stop drinking? Yeah, I'm gonna stop drinking. When? Well, soon. It was the same type of thing. Uh, hey, you're going to stop overeating? Yeah, I'm going to stop. I'm going to start going away. When? Soon. <laughs> so I was coming up with the same cock and bull story that any addict will tell you 
in terms of an intervention or conversations prior to an intervention. But in terms of under-earning, no one's going to pull me over to the side of the road and put me up against the side of a wall for running a te teleprompter machine on Channel 5. <laughs> You know, it's like, and I put a great spin job on it. I, I was like, hey, guess who I worked with today? Uh, who who you work with? Oh, Paul Newman. Well, he was doing a you know spaghetti commercial. You did Paul Newman. What is he like? In other words, how well, how much did, you, did no one said how much did you make today? Oh, I made one hundred and twenty five dollars. Uh, really? And uh, what what's your plans for the future? Oh, I don't have any. I'm just going day to day, like a mouse in a treadmill. <laughs> because under earning doesn't have much vision it doesn't we're not thinking about where we're going to be in a week from now or a month from now or five months from now or a year from now because if we really do that means we have to take difficult actions which relate to fear the number one the daddy of them all the daddy of all character defects fear okay let's say yeah in five months from now i want to you know I want to be working on a Broadway play. Well, you better start auditioning now. No, I think I'll wait. I think I'll wait. There's a great saying, I probably is Chinese and it's probably about 5,000 years old. If you want to understand your present, please everyone write this down. If you want to understand your present, look at your past actions. If you want to understand your future, look at your present actions. If you want to understand your present, look at your past actions. What did you do? What didn't you do? If you want to understand your future, look at your present actions. What are you doing now? What are you not doing now? Fortunately for us, we don't have to look at the severity of those questions alone. Thank God. Because guess what, folks? We can't. We can't navigate alone. And what I mean by navigation is what's the next best step for your life? What's the, the, the next best step after that for your life? What's step C for your life? Is it going to your acting class? Is it not going to your acting class? Is it going to an acting class? Is it going to a business school? Is it going to the business school? Is it working as an intern? Is it working as an intern? Is it? It's endless. Each life is so organic that only God can tell us the truth. See, we don't really know, and this is about step three, we really can't see the entire truth. We've had so many, we've had action, how many people have had action meetings where, you, where the actions you've had seem like they totally came out of left field? But when you did them, there was some logic, there was some wisdom to them. Because you, you polished it over here and it's shown over there. Or maybe some insight came out of which opened something else up. We can't do that alone. We cannot do that alone. And the beautiful thing is, is that the allegedly normal people never really created anything alone either. Apple computers were not created alone. They were created in the garage. Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, Hewlett had Packard, Hewlett Packard. <laughs> the Wright brothers, it wasn't Mr. Wright. Uh, all Companies, all wealth, were never created alone. But we think that we're just going to do it alone because we're afraid of being more spiritually wounded than we are. That's basically the whole core of under-earning. It always comes back to the fact that we're like animals that have been wounded through our abuse and neglect that we went through. And so we're doing everything we can to take back our will in step one, and, and, and protect us by living in, 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 in whatever type of cave or hole where we feel safe, some dark hole. It could be, the, the, a dark hole could also be working as a cab driver. A dark hole could be working in, in, in a warehouse. So we're doing everything we can to keep our light hidden. We're doing everything we can to keep our light hidden. And that's why we need the steps. That's why this is a spiritual program. This is not a motivational weekend where we're going to go out and rock and roll next week. It's a spiritual program. We get a daily reprieve based on the quality of our spiritual recovery and based on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. So what I'd like everyone to do now for the next 15 minutes is to do some writing. 
based on step one, two, and three. Again, the principle of step one is surrender. Principle of step two is belief. The principle of step three is commitment. And then we'll do a little question and answer or we'll do some sharing. So we're gonna continue, we're gonna do this until eight o'clock or maybe a little before eight, till about five to eight. So I really believe that writing is a way of telling ourselves the truths that our thought processes may not avail. Okay, great. How was that? Was that a good experience? Yeah. All right. You got to get out of the shell. Okay, what is the principle of step one? Uh, principle of step two? Principle of step three? Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions about what we've done? Would anyone like to share on the writing or experience you just had? Eddie. never came up for me before. Because what I did is I, I turned the first principle into a question. So the, I, I asked myself the question, what do I have to surrender today? I never asked myself that question. I always look in the long term. You know, what do I have to surrender today? So I came up uh, a number of different things, and these are all external things that I need to begin. You talked about auditioning. need to do that to get rid of the place I have in California and basically to do the work, the work of stretching myself. And this is very hard internal work. This isn't like just getting up to work. You, you know what I mean. This is getting, this is the energy that's needed, the commitment that's needed to practice how to play a guitar every day. And to do that kind of work. And then there's a couple other things. And then I asked myself, but so as, uh, this was an interesting thing. Then, so then the second thing is, what do I have to believe in, in order to surrender, which was a completely new idea. So I came up with, I came up with that I can accomplish it, that I can do it, that I will get, uh, that it will get me there, that I'm good enough, that I'm valuable enough, that the commitments are worthwhile, that I am worthwhile, and that the change can change my life, and that I'm worth changing and that I am the change so these are all gradual things I'm coming from I'm worth the change then I am the change and that the universe wants me and that it's not too late and that there's a place for me so I realize that these beliefs need to be in place for this surrender to happen then I ask myself about about what the commitment is well what is the commitment well so it's the Nike phrase uh, just go out there and do it, okay? And then that I have to move to the work. And I also have to move to the self. I have to motivate, I have to get the self to do. And, that, uh, and then I came up with uh, another uh, really interesting idea that had never really worked before, that I have to change the inner mechanics of myself, in order to do the external. The external, I have to be in movement of, of the external constantly, but I also have to be in constant interchange of the mechanics of self. So in other words, to do the external, I have to change the internal. So it's a constant flux of changing the internal to move to a changing external. Because the external is constantly changing, the internal has to be in constant change of the external. They both have to happen at the same time. Anybody else would like to share on uh, what you've written or read? Uh, okay. My name is Dory and I'm recovering under earner. And uh, I put uh, for step one, really I listed things that involve my under being, under earning, under living, uh, my life being uh, one of deprivation, not of really um, 
deserving breath. And I gave examples like uh, I've gone from no place to live to places that make me sick. I haven't included leisure. I haven't included uh, vacations. Uh, I haven't included housing extras that make it a home, like pictures on the wall, landscaping that has a spiritual feeling to it. And so after I wrote these concrete things that I look at in my environment, I realized that spiritually what I have left out is a smile for the little girl inside of me to come out and play and show up and be creative and um, be accepted and fully alive. So then I wrote, I surrender to my powerlessness to stop this pattern of compulsion of insanity alone. And step two, I put, I believe uh, that God can restore me to this sanity. And in this program, the sanity is going to look like taking actions by writing things the night before that I'm going to do, asking God to work through my subconscious and my sleep during the night, the next morning to get on my knees and say, these are my actions that I have planned. Please guide me to uh, show me anything different or help me with these. And um, so that I'm not in self-will, I'm not in other people's will, controllers uh, that I have allowed in my life, but rather that I'm in God's will. Uh, two minutes or three minutes or so and one more share John come on up wow I'm a movie star now huh <laughs> singer time for your screen test step one uh, yes Surrender is one of the <clears throat> principles of um, step one. Before I needed to surrender, I needed to be willing uh, to look at the step, to admit that my best thinking got me here. <laughs> uh, and that brings a sense of humility and, and, and hopefully a way to look for a solution. But if I don't surrender, and any, any really, any addiction fits on that first step. It's really, it's no rocket science. Four principles, step one. Step two comes around, there's belief. There's also uh, a soundness of mind is the opposite of being insane. So seeking the truth is also a principle in step two. Truthfulness and belief, and then belief, well, keeping an open mind that something could restore me because, guess what, insanity means I'm mentally ill, and it doesn't matter if I have a PhD. Uh, and that's really hard for a person who's highly analytical to really accept deep down. <laughs> you know. um, but what the heck, you know, I really gotta laugh because I'm not, I'm not a great manager of my life. I'm, I, I already know that. Step one tells me that. In step three, I think it's always important to say, okay, well, what's the principle there besides decision making, right? But more important, what is it that I'm turning on that, you know, on that third step? If it's telling me to turn something over to God because, you know, I'm looking at step one and two and it, nothing there looks pretty for me, um, then what is it that I need to turn over to this thing called God? So there are three basic instincts. Self-will is what I'm turning over. Self-will, i consider three basic instincts in my ambitions. That I need to turn over. But before I do that, I, I also got to turn over my, be willing to turn over my thinking and my actions to that, that God of my understanding. That I'm just beginning to understand because in step two is when you, you first see that this, you need to start looking for a concept of something greater than you because guess what? You're not God. And a good sponsor will tell you that. So, but I said self-will, my, th my thoughts, my actions, self-will, which is considered three basic instincts, God-given, therefore good. We compulsive people, of course, like to twist them around. And then we create problems for ourselves. The ambitions. We want to be prosperous today. That's, isn't that an ambition? Oh, I want that. Um, that, I got to turn over also to God. And guess what? One more thing. 
my direction in life. See, I think that I wake myself up, that I am the creator of my gifts or whatever. That's the small self. That's the ego telling me that on a daily basis. So I say, thank you, ego. You were great for, you know, bringing me through, through this life. But, you know, I, I also have higher consciousness today. So I got to look at these principles and live by them. So I realized today there is that small self that gets me in trouble, and I need to seek that higher self. Thank you for letting me Great. share. Great. Thank you, John. All right, guys. Well, that's the workshop. Thank you all for showing up. Tomorrow we're going to begin step four and five. Should be a fun experience. Uh, let's close this out with the serenity prayer. God, grant us a serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Breakfast is served. Ah!